early morning at National Defense Headquarters. Staff officers prepare for a special briefing. The subject, the security branch and its military police. They have come to the meeting with one fact clearly understood. The Department of National Defense and the Canadian forces cannot protect Canadian sovereignty effectively unless in turn they are protected from foreign intelligence interference and from criminal activities. This is where the MP comes in. Individuals specially trained in security and law enforcement who permit force commanders to pursue their objectives without being encumbered by any such threats. However, a commander might ask, how much can I rely on that MP? No matter how good the policies and advice may be, if it all falls apart at the operational end, well then what's the use? The answer lies here at CFB Borden. When you hear the name, you think of training. And indeed, it's here in the buildings surrounding this quiet patch of green that the Canadian forces train both their police and those of other nationals in the techniques of community policing and in the provision of police and security support, both at home and abroad, to safeguard against sabotage, espionage, terrorist attack, or criminal acts. Right! If we look globally, what could that mean for Canada? The sentiment of the community, the characteristic spirit of the community as a, as a country, what could that mean for Canada? Could it mean that, first of all, we have a democratic government? For the newcomer, such as ordinary seaman Trina Wilson here, the first lesson comes loud and clear. Those who have chosen a career in military policing are expected to live up to the highest standards of professional conduct. As peace officers trained to regular force standards, MPs have a special trust and responsibility enhanced by the fact they are individually responsible for their conduct and actions. For Wilson and her classmates, this initial training will prepare them for their first tour of duty, usually as a base MP. But as her career in the security branch progresses, she, like others here, will return frequently to enhance her knowledge and skill in other specialized disciplines. At the practical training center, they will learn the techniques of investigating everything from traffic accidents to homicide. Under the remote but all-seeing eyes of their instructors, trainees learn to follow the painstaking procedures involved when a criminal act is discovered. You'll notice that when she picked up the bottle, she moved away from the table so that when she dusted, the residual dust wouldn't get into any of the other evidence in the scene. Then, in the school's laboratory, there are lessons in more sophisticated detection methods. For example, a well-laundered bedsheet, when viewed under a specific light, reveals evidence hidden to the naked eye. The critical problem of computer security is also covered, as are other contemporary developments in Canadian society. It's made clear to the MPs, recruits and veterans that while most of their procedures will require prior approval from higher headquarters, in most cases they must act decisively, wisely, and with split-second efficiency, and without benefit of a lawyer's advice. Nothing makes that more clear than this device called FATS, Firearms Training System, where an MP's judgment and reflexes are put to the severest test. You have just stopped a motorcycle with driver and passenger wearing no helmets.
By the time Wilson gets her badge and is sent off to her first posting, she will be able to handle the myriad duties expected of her in both security and policing at any Canadian Forces establishment. Duties laid down in, among other documents, the National Defence Act, the basis of military discipline. But she is also sensitive to the fact that whatever DND security needs are, military law still rests on the principle of justice for the individual. Seven Wing, just outside the nation's capital. Here, MPs come under the command of the Wing Security and Military Police Officer, who in turn answers to the Wing Commander and up through the Air Force chain of command. At the Wing, it is this officer who is immediately responsible for security and control. It's in this sound working relationship with their superior officer that the members of the Wing Security and Military Police Squadron have been trained to operate. While they are expected to conduct themselves according to their own exacting code of ethics, they are still part of the commander's team, and that officer must be able to depend on them to respond in the best tradition of the military. They, in turn, rely on him or her for direction. For the MP, there is the routine of police patrols, providing mobile escorts, traffic control, enforcing the criminal code and other regulations, conducting security checks, any investigations directly related to police duties, and at times, protecting military funds. There is also the support provided to civilian law enforcement and security agencies in the community. This involves assisting them in any investigations off base where DND personnel are involved, some of whom may be wanted for questioning or for law breaking. The emphasis here is on the collaboration that exists ideally between all law enforcement agencies and calls for both sides to understand the jurisdictions and professional courtesies which must be extended for the common good of the military and civilian communities. While criminal investigators go about their tasks, those in the security subsection are inspecting buildings and installations or checking out reserve and cadet units for possible security vulnerabilities. They also assist the Special Investigation Unit in conducting personnel security clearances, security education programs, and other counterintelligence protective measures. For Lieutenant Jacques Girard, the Deputy Wing Security and Military Police Officer, there are the duties of the middle manager and junior leader, keeping logs, records, and organizing the other administrative work that keeps a section operating effectively. It's hardly a glamorous job, but very necessary to the section's operations. The young security branch officer is also aware that for him, the experience is invaluable. Whichever discipline is involved, policing or security, both subsections are expected to exercise vigilance at all times, prepared to recognize any anomalies in the day-to-day -day life on base, from traffic violations to anything that could represent a security breach or a threat to military personnel or their dependents. Theft, assault, fraud, arson, suicide. Some investigations are relatively straightforward, others are more complex. The most serious, probably, is murder. The military police in recent years have investigated several in Canada and abroad. In such cases, a close working relationship with civilian police forces is imperative. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're here today for uh, a briefing on your upcoming VIP operation, which will take place this afternoon at 1400 hours. There are times when divisions blur between police and security operations, or between the jurisdictions of military police and civilian agencies. Here in the national capital, for example, that can happen with the imminent arrival of one particular individual, the VIP. To meet this special circumstance, the chief warrant officer is also designated as the wing VIP protection officer. In this capacity, he maintains close liaison with DND protocol officers and the RCMP's protective policing branch. Before an operation order arrives, of course, the sergeant in charge of VIP security will already have basic security in place. It then becomes a matter of determining whether the VIP is likely to attract crowds or demonstrators to the scene, or is simply in need of more discreet personal protection. 
Depending on the stature or the controversial nature of the visitor, there is sometimes a threat assessment conducted with other police and security forces across the country or abroad. Among other arrangements, the section's aircraft security officers, who all have special training and knowledge about the type of aircraft to be used, go to work checking out the plane and setting up the necessary protective quarantine. If the aircraft is heading outside of Canada, one or two MPs will stay on board to handle security at its various destinations. Meanwhile, the Chief Warrant Officer has coordinated his personnel's actions with those of the MP section and with the RCMP. When you stand by to receive some information, reference a VIP visit. Niner Charlie Security 3, the motorcade is five minutes out. Over. Charlie, security three, the motorcade on base. This is the security branch's nerve center in Ottawa, in military parlance, DG Secure. It's here that threats to DND personnel, sensitive information, and facilities are assessed, and plans to meet them are developed. Whether it's a matter of law enforcement or security, the Director General and his directors confer regularly with other security personnel at command level. Following these consultations, policies and operations are given their priorities and are then put in place. One key security operation has to be the National Defense Security Clearance Program. Anyone joining DND in uniform or as a civilian must undergo the scrutiny of specially trained personnel in the Special Investigation Unit, as well as checks by security clearance personnel in Ottawa. The goal, to ascertain the reliability and loyalty of the applicants. There's your nominal role, Frank. The Special Investigation Unit is also a key player in DND security investigations, counter-terrorism, and counter-intelligence operations. Use the money. One of DG Secure's prime responsibilities is the operation of the Canadian Forces Service Prison and Detention Barracks. While rehabilitation is what this institution's staff strives for, it is aimed at through a rigorous disciplinary code that leaves the offender in no doubt about his or her shortcomings. Dirty bucket! Life here is not an easy one by any means, but the individual should leave here with a clearer understanding of what self-discipline is all about. James, would you come in and bring your stand up pad, please? Yes, sir. Much authority is, of course, delegated. But when acting as advisor to the chief of the defense staff, the minister of national defense, and other senior officials, the director general's role is a direct one, especially during times of national crisis. Within the three environments which the security branch serves, Maritime Command has at least two special responsibilities port security, and police and security assistance to visiting warships. The command has bases at Esquimalt on Vancouver Island and at Halifax, where its command headquarters is also located. A reserve command headquarters is found at Quebec City. As with most ports of entry, law enforcement agencies on both coasts must remain alert to drug activities. 
Since its inception, the team of MPs assigned to battle this crime have worked closely with civil authorities to control it, both off and on DND property. Over the last decade, the declining number of individuals caught in drug involvement testifies to the success the military police have had. One vital element of support which military police provide to the Navy is the community-based policing model which takes in the married quarters. Morning, I'm John Workman, I'm the Community Relations Officer for the Military Police in Halifax. I'd like to explain to you a program. It is well understood that a family's welfare can have a direct impact on a sailor's morale at sea and consequently on ship operations. The MP's role in such a community policing system is significant and beneficial. Sensor 1, 4, intrusion, alarm, memory, alarm, bypass. Alarm system is off. Whether they're on peacetime deployment or sailing into a war zone, Canada's naval vessels rely heavily on electronic weaponry and EDP navigational systems. EDP accreditation surveys, computer virus investigations, and general advice to commanders are types of support offered daily by security officers and military police personnel. Another phenomenon of the 90s has been the frequent appearance of protest groups in the harbor, particularly when a vessel with nuclear capability has been in port. To ensure that pressure groups do not gain control of a military operation, Maritime Command has equipped its MPs with rigid inflatable boats, ribs for short, fast-moving vessels which can engage the protesters at their own level. Large ships are not that maneuverable, and the MP's job is actually to protect both ship and protester. The MPs receive special training in their handling from personnel at the fleet school. Jetty and port security, intelligence gathering, security liaison with ship commanders are some of the other duties which the commander of Maritime Command can expect of security branch personnel at this level. None of it made any the easier by the continual arrival and departure of foreign vessels and their crews. While members of the security branch have been found around the world, wherever Canadian forces or interests are involved, whether in Somalia, Cyprus, or former Yugoslavia, it's the 1990 Gulf War which offers a retrospective look at what is demanded during a period of international conflict. There was routine garrison policing to be done, but with it, extra responsibilities not encountered in a peacetime environment. Route and evacuation reconnaissance tasks were high on the list, as well as the establishment of prisoner of war holding areas. Scud attack warnings and the requirement to carry NBC gear at all times were part and parcel of the daily routine as branch personnel went about the business of checking out security violations, accidents, and the odd quarrel. It was clear that under the climatic conditions found in the Gulf, one needed to be fit and ready for all eventualities. At CFB Valcarche and at other army bases, there are field exercises built on training already received at the school in Borden, and which prepares branch personnel for duties in land operations like the Gulf. And today, under the policy of total force, it is to these bases that the military police sends its reservists for additional training with regular force MP platoons. Master Corporals Luc Renault and Suzy Gagné are typical of such trainees. In civilian life, he's a mechanic and she's a student. Out in the field, they're MPs in training. As members of a reserve MP platoon, they have come to Belcarche with some previous training. But what they are going to learn here is what it takes when the Canadian forces go into combat. There are lessons in camouflage and other concealment techniques. 
how to construct a trench, quick attack and defensive operations at section level, and a lot of emphasis on chemical warfare procedures where the trainees are given a thorough understanding of the proper use of mask, gloves, boots, suits, and monitoring equipment. When both reservists leave training, they will have a thorough knowledge of the tactical operations of the unit and formations they support. Their commander can expect them to contribute as effectively to those operations as do their regular force colleagues. Reserve and regular force MPs are twinned at the point when the training reaches platoon and company level exercises. Whether it's the down and dirty business of frontline combat, or route signing and traffic control, Luke and Susie, along with their fellow trainees, are all the while watched closely by their superior officers. Under the total force policy, reservists like Luke or Susie can expect more and more training for peacekeeping tours. In the past, Canada has been one of the few contributing nations to send full-time professional military police to these hotspots. As a result, its MPs and security officers have played a strong leadership role in the formation and operation of UN multinational detachments. Nowhere were these skills put to a more severe test than in the conflict that gripped the people of former Yugoslavia. One of the classic examples of what to expect on such a tour has been the Golan Heights. The usual routine duties concerning discipline, security and traffic support. But also the ever-present fact of contending with two hostile, often aggressive forces. Also, since military discipline and enforcement of military law is a national prerogative, Canadians work in concert with other MPs from around the world. A sense of esteem in one's unit and one's self, as well as basic diplomatic skills, has been a definite asset in such a working environment. Peacekeeping tours are not for hotheads or others who have not learned the art of quiet persuasion and diplomacy. In such instances, security branch members may find themselves answering to the commander of another nation's military force. History demonstrates such commanders have come to appreciate the high quality of training done at the CF School of Security and Intelligence. Speaking of operations abroad, there's one in particular I'd like to draw your attention to. Tehran, 1978. They called it the Canadian Caper, remember? We hid six American diplomats until we could safely get them out of the country. Several MPs were involved in that affair and their specialized training came in specially handy. I'm thinking of two in particular, actually. Sergeant Claude Gauthier, better known as Sledge Gauthier, and Corporal Junior Goss. During the time the Americans were in hiding, it was the MPs, members of the MSGU, the Military Security Guard Unit, who fielded bomb threats, power failures, and temperamental Iranian students in the embassy waiting rooms. Meanwhile, their boss, Sergeant Gauthier, and another MP, Corporal Goss, worked closely with the ambassador to keep the so-called caper secret. On the tense and dramatic day the six fugitives passed through airport security, Gauthier and Goss saw them safely through the terminal, and then the sergeant returned with the ambassador to shred documents and destroy communications hardware. It was Gauthier's zeal at that task which earned him the nickname Sledge. Another one of the younger MPs in Tehran at that time was Corporal Alan Haley. Today, he is Warrant Officer Haley, in charge of security at the Canadian Embassy in Tel Aviv, Israel. Once, security was left to whomever embassies could employ. But now others, like Haley, are found around the globe, as this chart in Ottawa demonstrates. In Bogota, Colombia, it's Warrant Officer Frank Collins who's in charge. And in a country where drug lords and terrorists pose serious threats to heads of mission, Collins' work is cut out for him.
As any embassy is a prime target for espionage and other assaults on security, the MP's duties extend over a broad range. There are checks of alarm systems, the routine security patrols which cover everything from the handling of paperwork to electronic data. Then, from time to time, there's the destruction of classified waste materials. Incoming shipments are scanned carefully and a close watch kept for any intrusion devices. Meanwhile, liaison with security staff at other embassies must be maintained in anticipation of any emerging threats. At the more critical end of the spectrum, the MP works with the ambassador and other senior officials to formulate and, when necessary, to institute emergency measures during a period of crisis. The nature of the MP's work is such that it carries beyond the walls of the Chancery. Supervision of security conditions in embassy staff's private quarters is also required. Hospitality has always been a key element in a diplomat's duties. Here, it can never be forgotten that Collins and his staff must not only protect their bosses, but any of their diplomatic guests. For all that, there is still time for a long-standing tradition. A 35-year-old military police fund, which to date has raised more than two million dollars for blind children. Meanwhile, Collins is not a machine, and he must also live in the society of the country where the embassy exists. Here, alone in a foreign land for a substantial period of time, he and his family have had to go through the cultural adjustments that go with making your home in an alien environment. The sharing of experiences with a mate in a foreign land helps at times to make life more pleasant. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day taskings which face the MP abroad, marital stability and a mature outlook in one's private life becomes an absolute requisite. The efficacy of the military chain of command has been tempered and honed on battlefields around the world. One of the essential links in that chain is the man or woman the commander looks to for skills and expertise in policing and security matters. The security officer and his colleagues in policing have a clear understanding of the duty and loyalty they owe to the commander of their unit and stand ready to serve to the best of their ability.